Yay Networks. Hey, y'all. What up, everybody? Welcome to This Is Life. And I'm back. I realize I've been out for like three weeks. <laughs> it's been longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And you dropped this massive bombshell of like the journey. I did. It's okay. I'm here. <laughs> I did. I did about the whole journey about my dad. L- lay your head in my bosom. About, about <laughs> your, <laughs> lay your head on my breast. <laughs> on my breast assist. <laughs> lay your head on my breast. I got you. Yeah, we did. Um, if we- you haven't already checked out the uh, previous episodes, I encourage you to. So I shared that on August 26th of this year, my mom shared with me that pretty much the man who raised me um, was not my dad. And um, which was, I mean, it answered a ton of questions, a uh, lot of questions. Y'all don't understand. So when I first <laughs> met him, I, I think I told my best friend, or I told my best friend or my niece or somebody, I said, I think he got switched at birth because I look at his family and he don't look like his daddy whatsoever. <laughs> like not even close, not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. Not even not a even little bit. bit. And so it, I, I feel like it definitely put the pieces together. Yeah. Which is the title. Yeah. today's podcast which is the missing piece we were I, okay should i share my side of the story of all this yeah go ahead okay so many people know that i'm adopted and You're adopted yes oh, okay, my bad. <laughs> i'm adopted and i was adopted at the age of six months and i had found out um pretty much i had one of my half sisters reached out to me on we did the ancestry thing or 23 and me one of the blood tests yeah and it popped up and she said by any chance are you my older sister heather i've been searching for you my whole life and mind you we're driving to beverly hills yeah to go to a dinner that was planned for my wife by her uh stock group her yeah. stock investment group yeah and so we're on our way going and and then she's sitting in the passenger seat and she looks over at me and she's like Oh, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Right. I was like, oh, this is this is crazy. This is crazy because this is two weeks after kind of the bombshell hit you, right? Right. But your mom said to you through all that stuff, like, I know you're missing piece. You're missing pieces finding out. Well, I mean, uh, so how how that happened was we were sitting at the table and, you know, she was saying, I want you, I want you should call coach. You should call coach, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. And. You know, she wasn't saying call your dad. She was saying, I want you to call your coach, call your coach. And I was like, I don't want to talk to him. I want to talk to him. And then <laughs> she finally looked at me and she said, this is the missing piece. Yeah. And I looked at her and I said, what are you talking about? At this yeah. point, I'm getting annoyed. Like, what are you talking about? And then that's when she just, she looked at me and she said, she handed me her phone. And she said, this is your father. And I was like, <laughs> I was like what? peeking outside and you about fell out. Yeah. I was like, what? Right. I was sitting down. Yeah. And I was, I was like, what, who? And she was like. Yes, this this is your this is your father, and I was like, "What?" But that the whole thing was she was trying to explain, "This is your missing piece." And so when I connected with my birth family, they said to me, "We're so glad we found you. We've been searching for you our whole life, and you are our missing piece." And so I thought that was so wild that you know your mom used that, and then also my birth dad used that same phrase, right? right. And my birth half sisters use that same phrase like we've always known about you um and we've been searching for you for you know 40 years my birth dad um I I think that I think the idea of everything that happened was kind of foggy my birth mom was a teenager she was really young but long story short I got put up for adoption and he didn't want me to be put up for adoption essentially and um I ended up getting put up for adoption and he Thought I was born in November. Like he had my date of birth wrong. So All he was wrong. calling different foster agencies after he found out that I was given up for adoption, trying to call and find me. And he's like, yeah. I can't find you. So like, you're my firstborn child and I don't know where you're at. Right. So he's so excited. So I got a chance to talk to him on the phone and we we talk every week, a couple times a week. And he said that too, like missing, you know, you're my missing piece. And I, and I, and it's so wild to me though, cause I feel like when all that stuff was happening, like we were going through our process, we are working with our healing pastor, you know, working through our childhood trauma. And I feel like literally, you know, fathers are, are the start of it, right? Literally we're, God was healing us from the sperm, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? From the very, very beginning. Heal us from the sperm. What do you mean? Because it starts with you guys, right? I guess. 
from the fathers. You know no, what I mean? I'm joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I understand what you anyway, mean. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it's like you go, especially if anybody's ever been adopted, you go your whole life thinking you're giving up for adoption. And then you find out that actually you're somebody's missing piece and they've been searching for you your whole life. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I think I think it I think it really hit both of us hard because, you know, we we for me, I didn't know that I had a missing piece. Yeah. Internally, you know, something I, was I, off. Something yeah. was off. Yeah. Something was off. I remember my mom told me a story about um when I was I was younger. Um, I don't even know if I had started walking yet. I don't know, but you know, she was standing in Subway uh there in Newton, Mississippi, and you know, my dad walks in. Mm. And she had her back turned, but she, I'm looking like towards the door and I see him. She said, I just start wiggling in her arms and she's like, what's going on? Why are you doing Mm -hmm. that? And then she turns around and she sees him and she said, I had this big smile on my face. And I was like, you know, I was like reaching out for him. She said, which is a big deal. She said, because you didn't go to anybody. You didn't like people. Well, so, day. <laughs> as is, a child. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, that was just me. I, was like, I didn't go to anybody. Yeah. I don't want anybody to touch me, but I was reaching out to him. And, <laughs> and she was like, here. She's like, this is your son. Take him. And so I went wow. to him, and I'm like playing with his face and smiling. And what? and so she she was just like, you know, mm. did, that was just something that she remembered. And, wow. you know, if, if that was what I did as a child, then mm. something that it's like that internal marker was always there to yeah. be like, yeah. something ain't right. Something's not right. Something's you not know. right. And I knew something wasn't right. I just couldn't put my finger yeah. on what it was. Yeah. And so I've been living my life for 36 years, mm. not realizing that I've had a missing piece this entire time. And then that's yeah. when we start having conversations about and conversing about what, you know, what about all those people you know, across the world. There's so many. Who have these missing pieces. So many people do. And they don't even know. And they're trying to fill it with drugs, um, affirmation, approval, power, money, degrees. Like you're constantly searching to try to feel, you know, value and wanted. And it's just like, no, there's there's so many family secrets at times, right? I mean, I had a whole family secret. You did too. Like I didn't know that. You know, I was given up for adoption and my dad didn't approve of it. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't find that out till I'm 40. That's and then when, crazy. I remember, I never forget when you told me the story, like when you, after you talked to him, it was like, because it was like, a, it was almost like a completely different story. Totally than different. What, than kind of what, what you were given. It's like. I was given a totally different story like it, it from was the almost foster like was like agency. A, like a spot, like a, you, it, yeah. the story you were given was almost like he was just a sperm donor. Like he didn't exactly. really want you. Exactly. So you go your whole life with this almost identity in this almost way of thinking that you're unwanted, that you're unwanted. And meanwhile, God is like, you're so wanted first and loved by me. That's foundation. Right. And then you find out like, wait, my dad wanted me all along. He wanted you the whole time. He wanted time. to raise me. And it broke him as a man. It broke. It broke. It changed him. his life. It did. Cause it's like, you have your firstborn snatched away from you. Like that's traumatic. That's traumatic. But it affected the way he even, I hear, you know, parented the other children he had. And I feel like I wonder if we could be a little more compassionate towards people that have been through traumatic things like right. that, you know, where they don't have their family or they lost a firstborn or something happened, a couple broke up and you're pulled away from one one side, you know, whoever's raising the kid. Maybe there's a divorce or something like right. you never know the true story until you get older and you actually can talk to these people and find out what really happened. Exactly. And that's important to do to be able to, to be able to have some type of uh, uh, empathy. And open up your capacity for empathy because yeah. we're you know, we're looking at your dad and we're like, man, like, you know, this this is a traumatic experience. I even so look at my mom yeah. and also look at my dad. And and I, I do I do want to share a story. So I, I I had a conversation with my dad and we kind of talked about that missing piece type of thing. And it was interesting, something that he said to me. But my my dad, one the first conversation I had with him, one of the things he shared with me, he said, um, he said I don't, I, he said, I don't, he said, I, cause he, he, he's always known about my life. And he said, I don't, I didn't know if you needed me. Mm. Dang. Cause he's like, you know, it's almost like I've, I've followed your life. Wow. And from he's like followed Facebook, my life from, right? from Facebook. Yeah. And then your mom had sent photos. Yeah. And stuff, yeah. So he, he knew about my kids. He knew about you. He knew about all these things. And he was like, but I didn't know if you needed me. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> 
Like, are you serious? Yeah. So I, 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 I shared, because the reason why he thought that is he's like, I've, I've looked at your life and I felt like you've done all these things. You've traveled to all these places. You've written all these books. You've done all of this stuff. Like, what do you need me for? Yeah. And then I had to share with him that, yo, I did all of that stuff because I was trying to get your attention. Yeah. Because I wanted to be loved by you. Yeah. And I didn't even know you existed. I was yeah. I was doing that for somebody else, trying to get love from him. Yeah. And this whole time, I wanted that from you. And that was, I mean, that's a huge, big missing piece in somebody's life, especially when they don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, gosh, it's like you, you can't even imagine. But I feel like watching you go through your journey of healing helped prepare me for mine. Yeah. Think about it. Like, imagine two people get married, right? And they find out within two weeks. <laughs> They talk to their father for the first time in their entire life. Yeah. You know what I mean? That they're aware of. That they 12 years of. later. Isn't that wild? <laughs> 12 like 12 years, years later, later, within two weeks apart. Like years how can, later. How can you even, you can't even script that, right? I right. felt like at one point we were in a movie because you're trying to process your pain mm -hmm. and I'm trying to process mine too. And like, you know, I know that God's hand is on my life and your life too. And I'm like, I know things happen for a reason. I know God placed me in the family that I grew up in. And I love them so much and they're so amazing and I wouldn't change it for the world. They're so precious. Um, but it makes you wonder how many people are, you know, maybe you don't like your baby's father. So you're keeping him away from the father. Oh, or, man. You know, you're keeping your kid away from dad. But the thing is, like, they need to know who daddy is. They need to know who daddy is. You might not like his new girlfriend or his new wife. But if he is intentional and he's healthy and not toxic and not like, you know, there's there's boundaries like it's long as he's not like a drug dealer, you know, he's going to put your child in harm. But if he wants a relationship, because the thing is, your child could be sitting here. Oh, my gosh. At 36 and 40 years old, putting the pieces together, trying to figure out their life and saying, why did my mom keep me? You know what I mean? From my father. Why, why didn't you want me to have a relationship with him? You right. know what I mean? Right. Or it can be a case where, you know, you give your baby up for adoption without the approval of one side. You oh. know, like that's. That messes with people's. That messes with somebody's head. Yeah, it does. You know what I mean? It's it's it's, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think people really understand the implications that go along with it. Like I've I've had guys reach out to me and they're like, "Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if I should tell my son that I'm yeah. not his dad because you know he married the boy's mom when the boy was a baby. So and now this boy know, is yeah. you know he's 16 years old. He's growing up with this idea that that you, they, this must be my dad. And it's like, you know, no, dude, you need to tell him immediately because he, he knows, he has an internal, internal monitor. He knows. That is or saying, she knows. or yeah. she knows, he, it, it, it's saying to him, something's off, yeah. something's off, yeah. something's off. Because he's looking at you. It's almost like I'm looking in a mirror and I see an image that doesn't look anything like me. And we almost think like, I'll just love them. I'm providing for them and I love them and he's not in the picture. Right. But they still need to know. They still need to know. I know people that found out that they got, that they were adopted when they were like 25. Oh God, no. Uh -uh, you know what I mean? No. But it's like, this is what, this is how some people are. They struggle and I try to put myself in their shoes. They struggle with when do I tell my child? Absolutely. Because you know, they're, they might be too young and I don't want to tell them now, but I want to give you guys some advice. Um, I grew up in a home with 24 sisters and brothers. Um, there was a constant conversation. And even if you're the only one adopted in your home or maybe you only adopted one child, it's a constant conversation that I chose you and I adopted you. It's easier to tell that to a three-year-old than it is to a 33-year-old. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So because I was told so young, I, there was no defining moment where my my parents were like, we are your parents. Like, no, they're like, no, we adopted and chose you. You know, your birth parents gave us the gift of you and mm -hmm. they will always be a gift. And yeah. we love them so much. Right. And we pray for them. But God sent you to our family. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm supposed to be mommy. Right. I'm and you're supposed to be daddy. So having the constant conversation that you're chosen and you're called is better than just like overwhelming an adult. So much better. So it's better. so much better. And I it's, I think it's healthier too because it really allows for it really Absolutely. allows for the person to now be able to make a decision for themselves. Yeah. And, I, and that was something that, you know, I tell, I tell the guys reach out to me. It's like, yeah, you should tell them. Yeah. You should tell him or you should tell her. 
because you need to allow for them to have the right to be able to feel how they want to feel. It is their emotions. And it is not, I, I, I hate to tell you this, but even if you're their parent, it is, it, you shouldn't take it upon yourself to try to dictate how you want them to feel. And as you mentioned something earlier, it's like, what if, what if you're in a situation where the dad doesn't want anything to do with the child? I even think in, in those type of situations, if the dad is a drug dealer in jail, something like that, even retaining that type of information yeah. is, is still a missing piece because you're wondering, you got to think as a, as a child, you're thinking, well, my daddy just don't want me. My daddy, my daddy just don't That's want me. That's why he's not here. That's why he's not here. That's why he's not here. But the truth is, is that dad has been locked up in prison for 20 years. Or daddy's has, sick. Or daddy's sick. And daddy has 10 more years of federal yeah. prison. But you don't want to tell him that because I don't want to embarrass daddy. Yeah. But now, no, but but Johnny needs to know that daddy is alive. But the reason why daddy don't come home for Christmas is because daddy can't. Yeah. Daddy is the property of the correctional facility of Mississippi. Yeah. So you need to, it's important to be able to give pieces of the story so there isn't a missing piece. I need the full puzzle, even if some of the pieces are jaggier, or jag, jaggier in a word, but more jagged yeah. than than the others. There was a girl that reached out to me. She said she, her father had committed suicide when she was 13, mm-hmm. and she was told he had a heart attack. Oh, God. So she found out through, I guess, some uncle got real drunk. At the family <laughs> get together and told and said, you know, that's why so-and-so killed himself. And she just was shook. She was like, wait, what? My dad had a heart attack. So I think when they're young, you almost think, well, I can't tell you the truth because you're going to think it's a reflection of you. You won't be able to handle it. Right. But it's better to say he was very sick and he died from depression. You know what I mean? Like it's right. better to say that than to lie and, and create lies and lies because something still won't feel right. I feel like it's a Band-Aid that you will put on, mm-hmm. but it'll continue to bleed because it's not the truth. It's not the truth. And you have to tell the truth. You can't have secrets in your family. Right. You just got to you gotta tell them. And, yeah. And you got to you gotta let people know. Like, uh, we're, we're very honest with our children. V- very we're honest. Very, very, no very honest with Very, very honest with our yeah. kids. And, you know, uh, we, we have very open conversations <laughs> with them. But, we do. No, we, we do. And I, I think some, I mean, we, we talk to them like they're adults. We do. Most times we're like, nope, this is what it is. Yeah. This is mom and daddy. And and because we want them to know that number one, life is not all life is not all roses and strawberries. It's not. And then number two, we want them to to also know that, you know, it's it that you're gonna you're gonna run into things. Things are gonna happen, but the important thing for you to know is that this can be overcome. Yeah. But we want to be able to provide them with the entire puzzle. The entire and not a not a missing piece. Here's the entire puzzle, and then we're gonna allow for you. To determine how you want to feel about this. But the good thing is now that they're children, as their parents, we can help guide the conversation. Absolutely. With the truth. This is the truth. It's not pretty. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not everything you thought it would be. Yeah. This is the truth. And here's the hit. And then this is this is how this is how we package. Okay. So we're talking about not feeling like (laughs) you're enough. Parking is donkey. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, when you feel like you're 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 never enough. You want to go first. I, I think. I mean, I you wanna you wanna kind of give them a little bit of where this came from. Uh, not any details or oh, anything, yeah. but just kind of like a general area think, of where this comes from. I think. I think people get hurt by people that are Christians, right? And may, they might have an expectation, even if they're not Christian, right? They have an expectation that somebody is supposed to love them. Yeah. And maybe a parent, right? And make them feel like they're enough and make them feel like they're valued. And if they are not getting that, right? For example, that'd be like, for example, this is just example purposes, but like, you know, Taylor's my sweet girl. If, what if I'm helping everybody else and everybody's saying how much I'm helping them, but I'm ignoring Taylor Yeah. and I I don't have time for you and I'm too busy. And it's like, she's going to grow up thinking everybody else is more important. And it's going to plant a seed in her saying that I'm not enough because my mom was too busy helping everybody else. I wasn't enough. I wasn't valued. Yeah. I, I, I like to call it the system. Yeah. Cause I feel like that's what it is. I feel like it's the system that is uh, this, this, it's just not, it's not authentic. It's not yeah. real. Um, it's, it is, it is a curation uh, or is helping to curate the false self and false identity in people mm-hmm. is used to help build, you know, ego-based operations that 
function more on personality and persona and peacocking yeah. than actual an actual change with people. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very difficult because so many people are living between like these this dichotomy of okay, well God is called God loves me and we talk about the unconditional love of God but then we're confronted by the very real conditional love of of humans. Yeah. And people have people do have this expectation and in which you know you you kind of you kind of you kind of really should have some level of it that says this person who at least gave me birth, that gave birth to me, yeah, would love me unconditionally, yeah, because that's and it hurts even more when that person stands on the stage mm-hmm. and talks about love mm-hmm. and talks about how Jesus loves you, no matter what you did, you can always come to him, but then you can't go back home. I had a guy, yeah. he's a now he's he is a he is um agnostic, he's a pastor's son, and he shared with me. He said, "How is it?" He said, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to believe in a faith that's supposed to be built on love when, when that, that same faith based on religion has caused so many wars Mm -hmm. built on hatred. And then he said, you know, I asked him about going to church and he said, well, how, how, how am I supposed to just go to church somewhere when my own father kicked me out of his? Yeah. And I thought, man, like where, where have we lost it? Yeah, I think the crazy thing is those parents are doing the best that they can. And sometimes their best is exactly what it is. It's almost like we have to release the older generation from any expectations that we have towards them because they're doing the best that they know how. And sometimes their best for you is not enough. And I feel like we have all these expectations and projections of how we think things should be instead of accepting like where we are, right? Like I've learned, and I struggled with this before, like that fantasy world. I have an idea of how I want things to be, but the reality is this is where I am right now. And the space between here and fantasy is disappointment. (laughs) You know, over and over again, I'll be disappointed if I have all these expectations of how I thought it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly getting burned by putting all these expectations out there I've learned this is what it is and and what I'm gonna do is do better for this next generation like yeah. I might not love the way you know my father's passed but you know the one that adopted me but he's passed and I'm grown I need to heal from you know my daddy issues but now I can be a great mother to my three children you know I, 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 I do I get it. And I actually agree with you. I'm going to tell you why I believe that some of that is problematic. It is because we come out of our, we come out of the womb with a sense of dependency. Yeah. Our children have a sense of dependency. And even the way that God created and curated relationship and created beings, he created us for relationship. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why, you know, the, the, the Bible tells, you know, older women teach the young women, mm-hmm. older men teach the younger men. That's yeah. the reason why he gave children into the, he, he puts children in the households of mothers and fathers yeah. to be able to be raised in the truth and admonition of the Lord. There's a sense of, there's a sense of dependency that we do have. And, you know, while I do agree with you that we have to release the older generation from their you know, from the expectation of, of loving us or being there for us or anything else. I, 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 while we have to do that, us having to do that right now is how we, is how, what we have to do to cope, but it should not be the norm. I mean, it shouldn't be, but we can't change people. We, we can't, we can't change yeah. people. We can't, but, but my, my point here is that it, it should not be the norm. I and agree. that's what's that's what's wrong with our yeah. society now. Because it it leaves this imprint on us that says I'm not enough. I'm, I'm not, not enough. valued. And it's almost like we we're reproducing in our children. And the thing is you might have got that from your parents, right? And now you might be subconsciously treating your, your children like that. You know, nothing right. they do is good enough. Right. So I do feel like it's this cycle. And it's gotta be it broken. It it has to be broken. Yeah. I think I think one of the reasons why is because we have we have not grown beyond this reptilian, you know, mentality. Um, I mean, just a very low level thinking where it's just all about us and it's all yeah. about achievement. It's all yeah. about those things. And so 
we don't we don't we don't ever we don't ever get to that place of really doing real soul work. Like honestly, I look around at you know some of our you know, quote unquote elders, and I think to myself like I don't there's none that I I would want to replicate. I yeah. would want to be. Yeah. I mean, even though you know you look at some, they have they have money and they have you know this and have that. But I think to myself, how many of them have taken the time to do their own real soul work? You know, so that they can yeah. be healthy enough to really leave something behind mm -hmm. for for the generations that that are to come. We got a generation of millennials right now that are 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 in the thicket of raising children mostly. Yeah. And they're lost, confused, hurt, broken. They don't feel like they're enough. They feel rejected. They yeah. feel disowned. They feel outcasted. And I mean, what 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 are, what are they supposed to do? Yeah. I mean, again, I, I think the thing that's helped me just with dealing with my own is releasing them from having any expectations. I do feel like, you know, so many people, I just, you look around and you're seeing such a different generation growing up, right? So much frustration, so much anxiety, so much stress. And I feel like we're literally passing down generational curses, like over and over and over again. And I, I, Give me some advice here. How would somebody break that generational curse? You say well, we have to reconcile in our heart, but what does that mean? It, it means you have to do soul work. And for a lot of people, let me let me do this. For, for a lot of people, soul work won't start for you until you come to the end of yourself and the end of your resources. I, I hate to say that. That's real. But because the first half of your life is egocentric. It's all built around ego. Yeah. It's all built around you. That's through, that's how we get to avoid it, avoiding type of personalities. We start pushing people away because we start thinking about our own friendships, our own relationships. We start thinking about what we want to do, how we want to be great, how we want to how we want to live, and how we want to have money and do all these things. It's all based around ego. Yeah. And then you come to the end of yourself, and you come to the end of your resources, and you quickly determine, oh man, it's mm -hmm. not about me. Mm -hmm. That life is so much bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And because life is so much bigger than me, then it, it needs to be focused. It needs to be focused elsewhere. And it's usually in a very low point of your life. Yeah. Um, um, I heard this uh, the other day and it was uh, God's mercy is in the fall. Mm. And that same mercy is in the recovery. Mm. But we don't really understand the mercy until we have the fall. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you come to the end of yourself, end of your resources that you start to slow down. Yeah. And do and do the soul work. I think the problem with our older generation is that they never slowed down long enough to do the soul work. Yeah. Because they're they're still striving for something. I mean, look at look at look at all look at all the look at all the major preachers, the big preachers nowadays. They're still they're, they're speeding up. They're going faster. And it's like, dude, you're at the you're at the, the closing end of your life. Yeah. At this point, you're too tired. Yeah, yeah. But at <laughs> this point, your best work would be actually pouring the resources you have into those to, into those who are coming up but that's not what's happening so it's like we don't we're not we're not doing the soul work and people aren't slowing down long enough to do it so you, you have to come to the end of yourself that's the place where you're going to actually slow down and then you you really ha then you have to go through this serious process of of processing that crap yeah processing all that trauma yep because people aren't people aren't taking the time anymore to do that babe yeah and I think that's the thing that is is very you know very troubling, you know. We have to we got we got to do something about. It. I mean, you. What, so what what do you think? I think first, um, not putting band aids over the pain. Yeah. Not just like pushing it away. Um, it's there. <laughs> you got to deal with it. The wound's getting bigger, right? Um, so for me, therapy. You know, and I always say, Living Waters. That's a great resource ministry. They're awesome. Um, but I'm really good at gathering a lot of information. I'm really good at getting it all, right? But my issue for a long time was application. Like instead of just buying a new book every week, why don't I actually read one and, and apply what's in the book before I move forward, right? Mm -hmm. Because as soon as I realize I have an issue, I'll get all the books on it. I'll get all the stuff. I'll listen to all the sermons. But then it comes to the point where I'm like, all right, Heather, you need to start applying. So when those crazy thoughts come in, you need to capture them and speak to them. Don't just let anxiety run all over your life anymore. So yeah. it's just like applying what I know to be true, um, working out, eating healthy. I feel like those different things, taking breaks, resting, 
Like I love the scripture in Psalms where God leads us besides still waters. He's not leading us besides beside the ocean where it's like wild waves are crashing us and beating us up. Like he wants us to rest in him. And I feel like I find healing when I just learn to rest in him and trust him and surrender how I think things should have been and surrender the idea. Cause I feel like the grass is always greener on the other side, right? In our head, it's always greener if we had this or if we had that, but I'm learning in the season, just contentment in the Lord. Like he's enough for me and that's enough. And I'm satisfied with that. Yeah. I ain't satisfied with that. I'm glad you satisfied with that. I, I ain't satisfied with that. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that place of, of wanting to believe that that's enough and contentment and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I feel like I got, I mean, I, I do have a, I have a lot more soul work to do and a, a lot, a lot more places to just kind of work on. I, I, I wish I could just say, man, you know, it's just contentment in the Lord and just being, being very content on that. But I realize how much of my, my previous life was so built on ego. Yeah. And so I'm having to dismantle and deconstruct all of that that ideology. Yeah, that's real. So that I can get to a place where I can say, you know what? I actually believe in this whole contentment thing. And I think that one of the things that's helped me the most is recognizing that I'm human. I'm not focused on the performance anymore. I'm not focused on, well, yeah. I got to do this or I'm not doing that. Or I'm all, I, now I'm reading the books because I actually like the information that's in them. I don't read them because I want to be like, well, what do I need to do next to get healthy? It's like I, I, I'm, I'm cool yeah. with letting Psalm 23 be the course for my life. He maketh yeah. me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still water. So, hey, I'm going to lay down over here. I don't know why the he heck I'm laying down. my soul. Come on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay down here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go by the still waters, and, and, and I'm going to let him do the restoration and believe that he can do that. So. Amen. I love yeah. it. All right. Well, we love y'all. Thanks for tuning in. Yep.